Welcome to this session, Lessons Learned from Enterprise Cloud Security Programs. My name is Carl Otz, and I'm a cloud and security expert from Finland, currently based in Switzerland. I've worked with Enterprise Cloud Security for over a decade, securing over 100 cloud environments, and in my day job, I'm heading the cloud security practice at EPAM Systems, a global engineering company based in Pennsylvania. And I'm also a fresh author of the Azure Security Handbook. This is the plan for the session. Uh, I intend to keep this as cloud agnostic as possible, but there might be some bits and pieces of Azure jargon thrown here, here, in, in here, here and there. Don't worry about it. Most of these topics are translatable across different clouds altogether. So first we are going to look at a little bit of introduction to cloud security. I'm going to define what does a cloud security program look like for me. And then we are going to de delve deep into cloud security architecture components and some lessons learned. So in case you hadn't noticed, uh, the digital and security landscape has drastically evolved in the last 18-20 months. Uh, with a lot of organizations uh, were, who were taking a crash course to remote work, the perimeter is actually changing faster than ever. And public cloud vendors actually proved really themselves in terms of capacity and availability. Uh, this is actually a quote from, uh, from Gartner, uh, so the analyst, analyst Gartner. Uh, and, and really the cloud computing model is now ready to mature from these experiments of the early adopters uh, into becoming the mainstream computing platform for established enterprises or even the only computing platform for established enterprises. So it's no longer the question of will we go to the cloud or which parts of our organization will go to the cloud. It's we're here now. How do we get this in, into a secure mode? So let's let's have a look at that. We really need to start uh, stop thinking about cloud security as some sort of isolated domain of information security, which uh, which somehow is different from every everything else. And we need to start looking at how we can actually provide this uh, level of security, maybe even at least the lev same level of uh, confidentiality, integrity and availability into any of our informations uh, and assets as other computing platforms that we've used. And the cloud really can be just as safe or an unsafe against outside attacks as our on-premises systems. So what I like to call this uh, new approach is cloud native security. And I, d I don't really mean container security or cloud native computing foundation or Kubernetes security. I mean security that is built from the ground up with the cloud in mind. So let's uh, let's have a look at what 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 would it actually mean. So as with any other paradigm shifting technology, securing the public cloud is is really not as simple as extending or replicating our existing security controls into the cloud world. So the technology has changed really drastically. We have seen changes in the network perimeter. We see tons of signal knowledge coming in with new types of monitoring, uh, a new type of cloud health information that we didn't even have available. We didn't know we existed uh, previously. And also the business has changed actually as well. Uh, the business demands more flexibility, faster time to market, and they might demand access into technologies that they didn't have available or they don't have available in the existing hosting platforms that you currently provide from, from your existing systems. And it really does require a completely new, drastically new set of uh, new approach here. So to fully secure this, this new approach, this cloud native approach, uh, secure public cloud platforms, we need to understand them deeply. And this requires both upskilling our existing information security office organization or security office organization. They, they sometimes st start to collate nowadays as well. Um, but also it requires that, uh, so, so we need, need more cloud expertise for this security office, but it also requires that we actually shift the way that the security responsibil responsibilities are actually spread across the organization. And I, and I don't mean shift left in a way that we 
get security a little bit closer in the development lifecycle. That's that's great. That's that that's good stuff. We need to do that for all of our existing uh, and new development, new application development. What I mean is that we need to understand what sort of responsibilities are shifting when we are using, let's say, platform as a service type of components, and how does that affect our threat model and our overall security posture. And our cloud native security needs to be specific to individual clouds. If you want to go multi-cloud, most likely you want. That's absolutely fantastic. You are perfectly at your rights on doing so. But you basically need to implement multiple cloud native security programs. So each cloud will need to have their own program, their own expertise. You can share some common cloud security frameworks across of these. You can share, especially from your compliance and reporting internal audit purposes, it absolutely makes sense to get some sort of a common frameworks and common language across these. Um, but I really recommend you to start with one and then land and expand based on that. So rather than bolting on your existing controls, tools and processes on top of this cloud environments, you now have a perfect and unique opportunity to actually build security into the very platform of your workloads. Um, and that's that's really what cloud native security is, is all about. I mentioned understanding our environments and the key component of this cloud native security program is really the cloud security responsibility matrix. You must must have seen this before if you've taken any CSA, looked at any CSA materials or NIST materials. This is the generic one. This is the generic cloud shared responsibility matrix moving from software as a service to on-premises or on-premises to software as a service. And we see that we give out responsibility moving from on-prem to SaaS. Uh, we get better security out of the box in serverless environments, in software as a service environments, but we have less controls available for left for us. So we need to understand what's there. If this level of abstraction is enough for us, if not, we need to go one level lower. We need to go to platform as a service or eventually even uh, infrastructure as a service. So as we move from on-prem, infrastructure on-prem to infrastructure as a service and further up in the cloud model abstractions we give up this control of configuration and operation of these services but the csp the cloud service provider actually assumes the responsibility of securing these services physical security no longer our issue network security in a lot of cases no longer our issue but as i mentioned this is a generic one you should actually build the same for each of the cloud service you are using as part of your threat modeling or hardening work. Here's, uh, here's an example. So a, a common misconception related to all of this cloud security uh, area the, and source of misconfigurations uh, is rooted in this incorrectly understanding these shared responsibilities. And this can really lead uh, into misconfigurations and even, even completely different operating models if you don't understand uh, what's at stake there. So I really recommend you explicitly map out the shared responsibilities of each of the cloud services you are using. And this is an example of how to do that uh, in a higher level for a managed Kubernetes service uh, scenario. So think Azure AKS, AWS EKS, uh, Google GKE. So while these services are actually partially managed by cloud vendors, they actually don't, they are not actually provided as platform as a service. So the CSP actually is taking responsibility for creating and configuring and even some parts of the operations of the Kubernetes control plane of the Kubernetes environment. This, so this includes everything that's basically in the Kube system namespace. It includes Kubernetes API servers, etcd, Kube D DNS, all of that. But this is the crucial part here. Crucially, you are responsible for significant parts of these operations of the Kubernetes service that you're using, even if they are managed services. You're responsible of access control. You're responsible of in-cluster network controls. You're responsible of patching, or at least applying the patches or restarting uh, of those virtual machine nodes against vulnerabilities. You are responsible of inventory and asset management. You are responsible at, of all of the hardening work inside there and eventually, of course, application security.
All right. Now that we understand high level what sort of security approach are we taking at, let's have a look at the cloud native sec uh, excuse me. Let's have a look at cloud security programs in enterprises. So designing your cloud security program requires a careful balancing act between the brave new world of cloud and the existing internal and external security requirements. So in this picture, I have an idealistic image uh, from a security person's point of view. I would like to get the scale steps tipped toward the requirements on the right here. So existing security requirements, uh, security awareness, existing enterprise architecture and existing security enterprise architecture. But in many organizations, actually, I see on the left side here, need for speed, the simplicity and ease of access for shadow cloud type of environments actually overweighing the right. So the question really will be, so the core question really will be, how can we agree on these security guidelines that keep us both competitive and secure? And uh, this is especially true when security expertise is sparse. Cloud security expertise is even more sparse. And more often than not, this expertise is actually scattered across the organization. We might have a tiger team or a specialist team of cloud people who also understand security. We might have some specific experts uh, in their own areas of data security, for example, or in very specific areas in different teams. So we might not have common language or common uh, building of knowledge, sharing of knowledge uh, within those teams. Especially if we don't have a formalized goal in the organization from a cloud strategy perspective, where do we actually want to go? So you should be careful here because if your controls disrupt or slow down the cloud adoption too much, your business, I'm, I guarantee you, your business and your application development counterparts, they will turn to shadow cloud. And by shadow cloud, I mean they will provision their own cloud accounts or subscriptions in Azure, even connecting them with your existing environments, connecting them with your existing users, maybe even existing networks yeah, through VPN, uh, or at least integration uh, type of services uh, adding, adding to the mix there. And that's not really something that we want. Even if they are doing a perfect job, when something goes wrong, you are ultimately responsible for that. You need that visibility. You need that possibility to jump in and perform for forensics, fix things. And yeah, this is very carefully planned. Cloud security program really comes comes in. Um, uh, a cloud security program really defines your uh, risk appetite, uh, and by risk appetite, I mean acceptable risk level, uh, but also these appropriate security controls at the right time and at the right cost. Uh, so it's a the definition that I have here is that it's, it's, it defines the architecture policies and controls to secure your whole cloud, cloud environment. So it's kind of the opposite of this lazy anti-pattern of, hey, let's just onboard a generic list of controls or let's just implement a vendor CSPM tool and then, then we are done. Th that's our cloud security program. We really need to shift and actually combine our different different streams of security work uh, when thinking about cloud and for now for the second second part of uh, of this session we are going to look at more details what sort of our security architecture components are we talking about and what sort of mental shift maybe as a as a security architect or from a central security organization's perspective what sort of mental gymnastics do you do you need to perform So to implement your cloud security architecture, you can conceptualize uh, these required components, security architecture components, uh, into these reusable and modular building blocks, which I'm going to talk about now. So these are the key building blocks. And as you can see, these are not security building blocks. These are actually from cloud adoption journeys from best practices, well-architected frameworks from these major cloud vendors, uh, from major analysts. Uh, this is the same language that you will, you will need to start talking about, uh, talking with if you, if you want to communicate this, uh, these controls into, into your cloud teams and cloud journeys as well. So we have three different parts in here. So we have workloads, we have products, and we have the landing zone.
So workloads, so basically your applications, they are the reason why you are doing this. So they are typically a collection of one or more cloud services. Uh, this can be very simple, like in Azure, it could be an app service uh, that is hosting a line of business application. It might be using some sort of, let's say, it might be a Java application using a managed Tomcat middleware as a service. And it might have connections, network connections to some sort of multi-tier microservices that might be running across your IaaS, PaaS or SaaS, or even different cloud service providers. So usually you have at least your storage, you have your compute, you have your network or integration layer. So uh, eventually uh, you will have multiple cloud services that are part of your one workload or application. And depending on your platform controls and depending on your, your approach, your architecture, these can be manually provisioned cloud services. So think, think about your developers, your application teams going into the cloud portal, AWS console, Azure portal, and selecting their default services over their Elastic Beanstalk, Azure App Service, whatever. And autom then you will actually pick those up in your, in your, in your uh, platform set of controls and you will configure those into proper, pro proper modes. That is perfectly an option. Or this, instead of enforcing stuff as policy as code, these can actually be instances of uh, internal versions of these uh, internal versions of these cloud services or products so what are these products basically the products are just infrastructure as goes they are internal versions they include your security controls built in they might be built by your internal subject matter experts or they like a tiger team or they might be built by the community who are then uh, com contributing those back into shareable hey i was the first one to configure this spark cluster in in our in our preferred cloud. I went through all of our security materials. This is, this is where I put all of this together. Here I'm contributing back to the wider community. There are different approaches there. And all of this is deployed into a landing zone or multiple landing zone. Uh, that's basically your secure cloud platform. This means everything, how you get your cloud, like the billing model with your so relationship with your cloud so solution provider, or maybe a, a, a MSSP, where you, who do you get your cloud from, all the way to network topologies, to enforcement of this account or subscription level security configurations using policy as code. So within this landing zone, we have key different areas. And let's, let's have a look at these areas. Uh, more detail. First, let's talk about identity and access management. So there's lots of new products here coming in into your intro identity and access management teams. Uh, you might need to start thinking about how do you integrate with your existing IAM processes because you will have a ton of stuff. You will have, you will need to think about whether or not you will have separate admin, admin credentials for a cloud. Do you need, most like you do, some sort of uh, cloud-only credentials that we, you, you will use for break-the-glass type of scenarios? Um, will you have all, all separate identity uh, provider to get all together, like separate cloud tenant, uh, such as contosocloudadmins.com instead of contoso.com that you will use for your software as a service and other use, case, use cases? And you will also need to start need to think about external user management. Quite often, the, as cloud and security expertise in the cloud are so scarce, you will, you will have quite a bit of external consultants coming in, maybe even more than you have on your, in your previous world. That, that means that you will need to onboard faster your cloud developers. You need to think about, will you onboard them using your regular, uh, will you provision them your company device? Will they be sitting in your office? Uh, all that sort of thing, or will you provision those credentials directly in the cloud? Will you have X accounts at all? Or for example, if you're using Azure Act Active Directory, will you use Azure Active Directory guest accounts? For example, there's are pros and cons in there. And, and finally, cloud role-based access control was meant for management plane originally when organizations started using those, but you also do need to consider data plane as well. So for example, you can have Ad, uh, privileged users who have access to write or create, read, update, and delete stuff in the management plane of your cloud accounts or cloud subscriptions. If you have like an owner account on Azure or contributor account in Azure that has that access, 
that user can actually go ahead and modify the data plane access in a lot of cases for your data sensitive services. So the contributor for your Azure subscription can actually go ahead and make themselves an administrator of your SQL database server. And same is true with, with different uh, management plane roles that allow access to modify all of those resources uh, that same 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 disconnect between management and control plane is true with other clouds and uh, other clouds obviously as well and and finally uh, these kind of persistent access becomes an issue throughout the whole devops life cycle because it's not just once where we need to go through all of these iam topics if you recall what happened with Solarigate. Uh, basically, uh, unused or kind of forgotten service principles were repurposed by attackers. Uh, they added their own credentials or they tapped into the existing credentials that had maybe uh, maybe too long of renewal times. And they were used for malicious activities. They were used to gather information. They were used to elevate privileges uh, and uh, perform malicious activities. So let's let's have a look at uh, that problem area a little bit, little bit further. So as you go further with your cloud adoption and you start building uh, new cloud services also on top of, top of cloud, or even when you are just re-architecting or re-platforming your environments, you will have, you soon realize that most of these new deployments to your cloud are not performed by a developer or an sysadmin going, accessing the cloud using their own credentials. Instead, the preferred model actually for deploying to production will, will be to use continuous deployment pipelines that then perform these resource deployments. And the benefit of this is, of course, that uh, any changes to the application resources will need to go through this CI/CD pipeline. We get to implement our shift left. We get to run our pre and post deployment scans. We get to standardize. We get to introduce change management. Uh, more, we get more control, uh, but from an IAM perspective, this adds an additional layer of abstraction and complexity because from your application perspective, the CI/CD pipeline uh, and your cloud resources are part of the same IAM access scope. Uh, as, it, as a developer, uh, you will need to have some sort of perhaps read access to the subscription or account where you deploy your resources. And at the same time, you will need to add, have, uh, please create a, a you, need, you will need to have some sort of access to the pipeline where you can maybe push in your changes to the code that then triggers the pipeline that then actually makes that deployment. So you have two different systems, you have the cloud CSP and you have the DevOps environment and you need to combine in kind of a non-functional role uh, this uh, this from an IAM perspective, and more people, more, more applications, more people, more teams, more complexity. Basically, to secure this approach, you need to secure the identity used by this continuous deployment pipeline over here, uh, or their credentials. In, in Azure, this could be a service principle or uh, or some sort of uh, managed identity, um, but. This, this varies a little bit based on what you, what you are doing. You could also think about securing, uh, very, pr very strictly securing the build agents that are running this instead of securing the credentials. There are different approaches there. But basically, you will also need to control access, who can, who can modify this continuous deployment pipeline. Um, and from a logging auditing perspective, you need to put all of this uh, together from one application's perspective. All right, so the next part uh, of the landing zone beyond identity and access management, the next part will be this um, detection and monitoring, auditing, logging. So, so basically, um, there are new signals that are coming in. There's plenty of new signal noise. There's cloud health providers. There's all type of new information coming, coming in into your uh, detection and monitoring capabilities. And you need to, in this uh, cloud platform, in, the, in this landing zone, you need to enforce audit log logging across the landing zone or landing zones uh, from any of these cloud services, these products. And also enforce, if you, if you can standardize, it, you can enforce, in this layer, you can enforce also the application level uh, audit logging. So if you have a specific landing zone for your, let's say, 
uh, top secret uh, information or if you have a specific landing zone for your PCI DSS uh, requirement uh, applications, then this is where you will do this in policy as code. In practice, uh, most of these services uh, do not uh, produce or actually actually their retention times might be quite quite low. So you need to also configure that uh, audit log creation, but also where do you retain that data and how long do you store that for? And then, of course, you need to integrate with your SIEM and, and your SOC uh, for any, any sort of alert or any, any active information there. If it's in the same cloud that you are working with, that's great. But if it's not, if you're collecting, if you are maybe taking information to your on-prem, you need to be wary about data egress considerations there. And then finally, you need to start thinking, you also need to preemptively work with your logging architecture here. And this is what I mean by, by logging architecture. Uh, in this example, uh, these are, I had three uh, Azure subscriptions here. I have a centralized log logging subscription and I have application A and application B subscriptions. And I've deployed in, in their resource uh, group groups in those subscriptions. I deployed my resources, I deployed my products, whatever I have in there. But I need to plan from the central architecture perspective and enforce in my landing zone will be how many of these log analytics workspaces do I have and uh, how many replicas, what are, what are the retention times, etc. So basically what I can do is I can enforce Azure AD logs and Azure Resource Manager activity logs so that everything on those control planes gets stored in my central log analytics workspace, but my application level logs could be, for example, stored for my in the log analytics workspaces for each of the application subscriptions or accounts. In, in that case, they would also carry the cost and get to actually access those logs. And finally, the third part of the key part beyond identity and access management, login and monitoring in this landing zone is the network uh, network security. So we need to think about cross subscription region and cross cloud traffic. We need, need to think about traffic across PaaS, IaaS and SaaS. And we also need to th think about application level traffic. Do I have a WAF? Will I have some sort of uh, cloud native tools? Do I bring my existing tools and knowledge uh, into this cloud network world? And for example, what happens with my Kubernetes environments? All of these are key considerations there. And, and basically beyond this native versus uh, kind of existing skill set, you should also think about how much will you centralize? How much will you uh, provide access to these new applications, disconnected application development teams that might do their agile fancy stuff uh, without, without the limitations of, the, of, of your team? If you don't know what they're doing, if you don't have the proper, if you don't have enforcement there that much, maybe it's a good idea to not give them access into your hubs. Uh, maybe it's a good idea not to provision them spokes into your centralized network hubs, for example. You might, for example, block creation of, of virtual networks altogether, or you might want to block creation of public IP addresses. And there's this kind of balancing act here to play with this centralization perspective as well. All right. And then let's uh, kind of to wrap all of this up, uh, let's, let's consider how do we map these existing security practices to the cloud world. Um, and let's talk about IAM vulnerability management and supply chain lifecycle. So I, I mentioned quite a bit about these new cloud access types such as uh, ma service principles, data plane access, managed identities, uh, access to DevOps, both at the same time as access to uh, access to our cloud cloud subscriptions and accounts. So IAM can really become a bottleneck with with all of these number of accounts uh, if you continue the old ways of doing things. So if if you recall this. Um, if you if you come across this this topic of hey we, our developers needs uh, need Azure Active Directory uh, permissions or they need service principles to do X or they need managed identities to do Y or they they need some some third party identities to do Z all of these will be then your identity teams maybe your Azure AD teams or maybe your existing IAM processes responsibilities uh, to avoid overloading 
uh, your existing IAM organization, you should really embrace automation. So you should you should use self-service tools and templates um, uh, to create these so-called cloud account vending machines, uh, as I like to call them. Um, these should allow your cloud application development teams to successfully provision these required IAM resources on their own, but with the proper configuration and kind of following your security requ requirements there. And then vulnerability management. Uh, there's lots of lots of topics in in this side, but basically we also to already talked about this this explosion of new signals such as cloud health information, uh, hypervisory information. All of that information uh, will provide you a signal, but not necessarily insight through all of that all of that noise. So you need to start applying some sort of automatic rules to uh, to kind of query. And, and, and filter through, uh, see through that noise. Uh, at the same time, uh, for vulnerability management scanning, uh, you should look at cloud native tools and re-evaluate re how your tools that have worked well on this kind of on-prem world where you know the IP addresses or where you can install agents on your own, you should re-evaluate re whether or not you can continue to use similar tools or are there any cloud native tools available for your environment and for those services that you are using. And, and lastly, containers. Do you really know all of the dependencies of all of the base images and all of the containers that all of your devs are running? Are you sure? Um, so basically, Containers are a big gap of visibility in, in a lot of these cloud environments. There is better and better integration with the existing tools, uh, AWS's uh, and Google's and Azure's uh, security center uh, and, and similar, similar tooling is getting integration into the information about what sort of containers am, am I running? Uh, what dependencies are there? Are they vulnerable to issues? And perhaps even if they are actually actively being run in any of my cluster, or are they just stored in my container registries? This is all crucial information that will again create you a ton of signal that you need to get through and working with uh, uh, and work with uh, to figure out what is actually uh, the information, what is actually the insight there. And finally, supply chain lifecycle, and this ties us nicely back in into this uh, question of cloud responsibility. If you if you recall, case Omigod from from this uh, this fall, early early fall this year, you don't always realize what you are responsible of managing. So Omigod was basically uh, in Azure. It was Microsoft created an agent for monitoring Linux ba Linux based. Uh, image, images uh, that was pre-provisioned for virtual machines. If you create, if you selected a virtual machine from Azure Marketplace, if you deployed that, uh, Microsoft actually provisioned also this Linux agent that was vulnerable to elevation of privilege ac attack. And as it was provisioned for you automatically, there was for a lot of uh, for a lot of users there was this misconception, even though this was well documented, that that Microsoft would be responsible of, of patching that, uh, patching that uh, agent as well. As it so happens, Microsoft is not responsible of patching that. If it's a VM that you have access to work, work with, chances are that in a lot of, all of these clouds, you are actually responsible of patching that VM, just like with Kubernetes, just like with IS uh, directly. And the same was true here with Omega, which was quite uh, widely discussed uh, vulnerability here. Uh, not only because it was uh, it was such a such an impactful uh, vulnerability in that in that existing uh, extension in that monitoring extension, but also because of this lack of awareness of who is actually ultimately res responsible for this um, for this topic. All right, and with uh, with that, it's uh, my turn to wrap up. I am very 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 happy to have talked with you virtually here uh, here today i wish we get back to more consistent 
ways of uh, of of traveling more consistent in-person events i really hope to be with with you there see you all next year at the automation summit in person and with that thank you very much <laughs>